This is African American History is American History. Welcome. I'm your host, Harlan Kearsley. This program's goal is to foster understanding, promote discussion, and expand knowledge through stories of historical events, bios of unsung heroes, as well as timely and relevant news stories, which hopefully will paint a vivid picture of the effects of segregation, discrimination, and bigotry on the lives of both blacks and whites. Comparisons will be made between the many racially fractured periods of American history and what's going on right now. He was the first African American to run for president of the United States. Who is it? <laughs> it's not who you think. Stick around. Born in Little Rock, Arkansas, on August 4th, 1857, George Edwin Taylor was the only son of Nathan Taylor, a slave, and Amanda Hines, who was a free black woman. Two years after George Taylor's birth, in 1859, Arkansas enacted a Free Negro Expulsion Bill. Now, this bill required all free blacks to leave the state. Failure to comply after one year, the remaining free blacks would be enslaved. Oh, shh. George, you hush now. You don't have to worry. You were born free. And I'm going to see to it you stay that way. Amanda Hines left Nathan Taylor and took her infant George to Alton, Illinois, which before the Civil War was part of the Underground Railroad on the Mississippi River. It would become a major river port for the Union military once the war began in 1861. Amanda Hines died from tuberculosis in 1862, leaving five-year-old George an orphan. George Taylor would later claim that he lived in storehouse boxes in the city of Alton all during the Civil War. In 1865, after the war ended, eight-year-old George Taylor boarded a steamboat called the Hawkeye State, which operated between St. Paul, Minnesota, and St. Louis, Missouri. Soon after the steamboat landed at the docks of La Crosse, Wisconsin, George decided to remain there. He took the name George Southall, living with the black cook on the Hawkeye State, Henry Southall, and his family. By 1868, the Southalls moved from La Crosse, but the 11-year-old George decided to remain. However, a La Crosse County Court judge intervened and remanded him to a black family, Nathan Smith and his wife Sarah. Now, the Smiths provided care for some of the county's orphaned or abandoned Negro children. They lived near West Salem, Wisconsin, and that's a little over seven miles east of La Crosse. George remained fostered to the Smiths until he reached the age of 20. Then he took the name of George Edward Taylor. He attended a country school near his home. He enrolled at Wayland University in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. And from 1877 to 1879, the 20-year-old George Edward Taylor studied a classical curriculum that emphasized grammar, language, and rhetoric. However, Taylor left Whalen before completing his three-year curriculum for health and financial reasons. In 1879, Taylor returned to La Crosse and changed his middle name from Edward to Edwin. On October 15, 1885, he married Mary Hall of Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. There are no known children from this marriage. As a polemicist, Taylor wrote articles for several of La Crosse's newspapers, as well as for Chicago's Inter-Ocean, a partisan newspaper intended to appeal to an upscale readership. From 1885 to 1886, Taylor became editor of 
the Lacrosse Evening Star, and from 1886 to 1887, the owner and editor of the Wisconsin Labor Advocate. Taylor was politically active at the city, county, state, and even national levels while living in La Crosse. As editor of the La Crosse Evening Star, Taylor supported the administration of Frank White Beaver Powell. Powell served two terms as the people's mayor of La Crosse, first as an independent with no party affiliation, and then as the champion of the city's working men's party, of which Taylor was secretary from 1885 to 1886. Taylor was also one of the founders of the Wisconsin People's Party, as well as its state secretary from 1886 to 1887. In February of 1887, he represented the state party at the Cincinnati Conference of Union Labor and became an advocate of union labor in Wisconsin. Taylor's rapid rise in La Crosse's and Wisconsin's labor movement drew much attention to his race. Now, this was at a time when the nation was reevaluating its racial attitudes, and not for the better. His opponents in the labor movement would constantly remind him that he was black. When Taylor returned their racial challenges in equal kind, his support base within La Crosse's predominantly white community dried up. In January of 1891, Taylor left La Crosse for good and moved to Oskaloosa, Iowa. There he became a community organizer and a Republican Party promoter. His focus changed from labor to race. For two decades, Taylor owned and operated a newspaper called The Negro Solicitor. He ran a farm, served two terms as a local justice of the peace, was a policeman, and switched from Republican to Democrat to Independent and back to Democrat. <laughs> and you thought you had a busy schedule. On August 25th, 1894, Taylor married his editor at The Negro Solicitor, Cora Cooper Buckner. Cora was 16 years younger than Taylor and brought with her a child from a previous marriage. There are no known children by George Taylor and Cora Buckner. In 1900, as Taylor became more active at the state and national levels, he moved from Oskaloosa, Iowa to manage a lead mine at Coalfield, Iowa. When Cora refused to leave Oskaloosa, the marriage ended in divorce. From 1900 to 1904, Taylor was the head of the Negro Bureau in the National Democratic Party and was also the 1904 candidate of the National Negro Liberty Party for the office of President of the United States. This is African American History is American History. In 1904, the executive committee of the newly formed National Negro Liberty Party asked George Edwin Taylor to become their candidate for the office of President of the United States. The National Negro Liberty Party had its origin in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1897. That was when it was known as the Ex-Slave Petitioners Assembly. The National Negro Civil Liberty Party's platform included planks that dealt with disenfranchisement, insufficient career opportunities for blacks in the United States military, imperialism, public ownership of railroads, self-government for Washington, D.C., lynching, and pensions for ex-slaves. Taylor's 1904 presidential campaign was plagued with one problem after another. The strong support that the National Negro Civil Liberty Party had promised Taylor failed to materialize. What's more, not a single newspaper would endorse him, and state laws kept the National Negro Civil Liberty Party from adding Taylor's name on official state election ballots. The votes he did receive weren't even recorded. 
It was later estimated that Taylor had received 65,000 votes nationwide. However, that number couldn't be verified. After the 1904 election, Taylor moved to Ottumwa, Iowa for health reasons. At that time, Ottumwa was known for its hot springs. He remained active within the National Negro Liberty Party and reconnected to the Democratic Party, supporting their candidates for local offices. As a reward for that support, he was appointed to a patronage position as a policeman attached to Ottumwa's Black Business District, known as the Black Belt. In 1910, suffering from what was described as pulmonary difficulties, George Taylor moved to Florida, where there was a large black population in Jacksonville. He married for the third time to Marion Tillinghast, a schoolteacher from Green Cove Spring, Florida. The exact date for the wedding is unknown. In 1911, the couple moved to St. Augustine, Florida, where George Taylor was manager of the Magnolia Remedy Company. They distributed curative salves and potions. By 1912, Taylor had firmly established himself politically within Florida and had reconnected at the national level. In May of 1912, he attended a state convention of progressive Republicans in Jacksonville that championed the candidacy of Theodore Roosevelt against the second-term bid by William Howard Taft of Ohio. Taylor supported Roosevelt. However, when Governor Woodrow Wilson of New Jersey won that election, during his 1913 inaugural parade, Taylor joined a group of past presidents of the National Negro Democratic League to march past President Wilson in protest. Throughout World War I, Jacksonville became the center of repeated outbreaks of Spanish influenza. Taylor retreated to a farm where he raised poultry. When the war ended in November of 1918, George Taylor returned to Jacksonville, where he became the editor of the Florida Sentinel. George Edwin Taylor, judge, journalist, policeman, activist, and candidate for president of the United States, died in Jacksonville on December 23rd, 1925. Sadly, no known copies of Taylor's newspaper, The Negro Solicitor, has survived, except for scattered articles reprinted in other newspapers or found in scrapbooks. For more information on George Edwin Taylor, may I recommend that you read the 2011 book for Labor, Race, and Liberty, George Edwin Taylor, His Historic Run for the White House and the Making of Independent Black Politics by Bruce L. Moser. This has been African American History's American History, the episode you were listening to the story of the first African-American U.S. presidential candidate was written and directed by Harlan Kearsley. The voice actor for this episode was Soraya Butler as Amanda Hines. I'm Harlan Kearsley. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed this program, please be sure to tell your friends. And if you haven't done so yet, take a moment to hit the subscribe button below. Once you do, you'll be notified as soon as new episodes are posted. Thanks again. African American History is American History. Copyright H.C. Kearsley, 2020.